Ε, καλησπέρα και από μένα. Ακούγεται. Okay. Ε, θα μιλήσω στα αγγλικά. So, uh, good evening to everyone. My name is Yasunas Apostolopoulos. And uh, over the past eight years, I have been involved in uh, maritime search and rescue activities in the Aegean Sea and in the Central Mediterranean Sea on board civil rescue ships, one of which is the Mare Ionio rescue ship, operated by the Italian association Mediterranean Saving Humans. The shipwreck of Pilos is by far the deadliest shipwreck in the history of post-war Greece, and one of the deadliest in the history of post-war Europe as well. It is also the biggest racist crime in the history of peacetime Europe. 650 people dead or missing. And it is a racist crime because I think we all know here that if they were European citizens inside the boat instead of migrants, they would have rescued them from the first moment. I think there can be no doubt about that. They wouldn't have left them for 15 hours in the middle of the sea. That's why from the first moment we, had, we heard a series of different narratives coming from the Greek government attempting to shake responsibility off their shoulders. The usual thing we hear whenever there is a shipwreck in Greece or in Italy is that we, European, European governments, are not responsible for these shipwrecks. It's the smugglers' fault. Traffickers and smugglers are to blame. They put the people onto these overcrowded uh, boats. Okay, I think again we all know here that smugglers exist because of the European migration policy. Smugglers exist because there are no legal and safe routes for people seeking safety and protection on European soil. And I'm talking mostly about the, the so-called migrants from the global south. Because European states have closed every border crossing, so the only way for a human being to apply for international protection in Europe is to pay a smuggler and risk their lives at sea, risk drowning in the Aegean Sea or in the Central Mediterranean Sea, or even worse, risk being tortured, uh, beaten, or even shot at the Evros border. So this is the main thing, that in 2023, there is no safe way for a human being to exercise this internationally guaranteed human right, the right to asylum. Another thing we heard about the shipwreck of Pilos, which it's important to mention, as Vasilis did, that it happened inside the Greek search and rescue region, is that um, Greek authorities said that we didn't rescue the people because they were not in danger because the boat was moving at a steady speed and course towards Italy. Okay, first of all, this is not true. And second, even if it was moving at a steady course and speed towards Italy, this doesn't change anything, because it's very important, and also to answer the question, it's very important to point out that 99% of migrant boats are boats in distress, boats in danger. Distress is not only when the boat is sinking. We do not rescue boats only when they are sinking. Then it would be too late. Migrant boats are in distress, are in danger because they are of extremely low quality, they are terribly overloaded many, many times above the safety level. No one is wearing a life jacket, a life jacket there are no life-saving appliances on board. There, are no, there is no navigational or 
uh, communication equipment, and they can collapse at any time. This was exactly the situation on the Adriana fishing boat. So the only action that the Coast Guard is allowed to do when they find a boat in distress is rescue, nothing else. Abandoning people for many hours at sea, or even worse, try to, to redirect them to change their route is a crime, and it's an action that can lead to a ma mass casualty event. For us, the civil rescuers, the shipwreck of Pilos is extremely painful and outrageous for another reason. Because we know that if we had been there instead of the Greek Coast Guard, nobody would have drowned. We have rescued similar boats many times with 500 people on board, with 600 people on board, and nobody has ever died. Nobody has ever, has ever been hurt during these operations. Because there are specific protocols, there are specific techniques. We, at least we have specific protocols and we have specific techniques for fishing boats like the Adriana. I don't know if the Greek Coast Guard has them. If they want, we can offer them. We can offer them to them. And if these techniques are applied, they can greatly minimize the risk. For example, the first thing you need to do when you find a boat like this is to approach it not with your big vessel, but with smaller assets. We have two smaller rescue boats that perform the rescue. And first of all, you need to calm the people down with the help of a cultural mediator. Then distribute life jackets and then evacuate them in small numbers, transfer them onto our small rescue boat and then onto our ship. Why did the Greek Coast Guard follow the refugees for four hours without giving out a single life jacket? Why didn't they attempt a rescue operation? And above all, why did they send the merchant vessels to give food, water, and gasoline to the people? Where does food and gasoline fit in? The people asked for rescue, not for gasoline. And they had the nerve to go on public TV, on, on, on the media, and accuse the migrants for throwing the food into the water. They had the nerve to say how ungrateful they are. We brought them bread and they were throwing it into the sea. It's insane that the people's lives were in danger and they were getting bread instead of rescue. Really, how can they prioritize food over life jackets when a boat is asking for help in the middle of the sea? Really, how on earth can they justify this thing? The answer is simple. The distribution of food and gasoline is a standard practice. We see it often. Malta is doing it, Greece is doing it, and they are doing it to encourage refugees to continue their journey to Italy. This is the thing. They give them supplies and they tell them, go, keep going, guys. You're on the right route, keep going. So their purpose is to deter people from coming to Malta or to Greece, even if that will make them drown a little further. They don't care. And according to the, to the survivors of the Adriana, indeed, the Greek Coast Guard was escorting the boat until at some point the engine stopped then they threw a line, they tried to, to tow them, and as a result, the boat capsized due to the towing maneuver and 650 people are reported uh, dead or missing. So to summarize, this shipwreck happened because 
the Greek authorities decided not to rescue the people, but instead to escort them and tow them out, tow them out of the Greek rescue zone so they could be dumped and uh, become the responsibility of another country, of Malta or in Greece. And it's important to mention this because in Europe, we are talking a lot about the push forward tactics of Turkey, Turkey's push forward tactics to Greece, that the, the Turkish vessels are escorting migrant boats to Greece, but we never talk about the push forward tactics of Greece to Italy, which is exactly what happened at the shipwreck of Pylos. Another thing that we need to question ourselves is why those people find themselves near Pylos in the first place. Why they find, did they find themselves near the coast of Peloponnese in the first place? Because if we, if we see at the nationalities of the people, there were Syrians, Pakistanis, Palestinians, people that were coming over on the Greek islands. Why did those people decide to get onto a boat in uh, Tobruk, in Libya, and travel 600 miles of open sea to reach Italy, whereas they could have uh, taken a boat from Turkey and make the crossing to Lesbos? It's only six miles. The first is 600 miles, the second is six miles. Why they decided to make a journey 100 times longer? because they know what they will face in the hands of the Greek Coast Guard. They know it, they have experienced it, and they're trying to avoid it at all costs. We are rescuing people in the central Mediterranean Sea, which have been, uh, which tell us that they cannot stand to be tortured for a second time. And they are not speaking about Libya. They are speaking about Greece. During our missions with the Italian ship, I can no longer tell to the survivors where I come from. Because after each rescue, we spend a lot of time on the deck and we are chatting. Where are you from? What's your name? Whenever I say that I'm from Greece, people show me scars from their body. People show me scars on their body from torture they suffered in Greece. And they explain to us how Greek authorities captured them, stripped them of their belongings, tortured them, and pushed them back to Turkey. Many people have been pushed back two, three, four, five times. So at the end, they left Turkey, they went to Libya, they got onto a boat, and we rescued them in the middle of the, of the central Mediterranean Sea. And uh, a few months ago, in May 2023, one of these illegal operations in the Aegean Sea was recorded on camera. The New York Times published a video showing, showing the Greek authorities kidnapping 12 refugees from the coast of Lesbos, including a six-month-old baby with its mother. So they kidnapped people who had already arrived on the island. They confiscated their belongings, they transferred them onto a Coast Guard vessel, they went out at sea, and finally they abandoned them, they abandoned them on an inflatable raft without engine and uh, went away. Unfortunately, these uh, videos never reach the mainstream media in Greece. We have a huge problem with this. In Greece right now, if you speak out against pushbacks, you are considered an enemy of the state and a traitor of the country. Because according to the government's narrative, refugees are no longer people who seek safety and protection. They are invaders, illegals, and a weapon in the hand of the enemy, in the hand of Turkey, Erdogan. So, they say that Turkey is conducting hybrid warfare against Greece by using migrants to breach the Greek borders. And in this context, 
whoever speaks out against these illegal operations uh, is accused for being a threat, a national threat. Many people, including myself, receive death threats from racist groups. And many people, uh, like human rights lawyers, activists, journalists, many of them are here together with us, are being directly targeted by the government. As Stelio said before, last year, at the exact same place, for the exact same uh, topic, the government uh, accused me for being uh, a traitor. Our answer to all that is that if love of country means accepting the killing of refugees on our borders, then personally I'm proud to be called a national traitor. And we need to stand up against this inhumane policy of deterrence and border brutality and demand, demand justice for the thousands of victims of state violence. Solidarity cannot be criminalized and solidarity will prevail.